Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Spare, O Lord, spare thy people, and give not thine inheritance to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Why should they say among the nations, where is their God? Words taken from the lesson for Ash Wednesday. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. In the book of Job, we read about how the friends of this holy man came to him in his time of trial. Thus, from this book we hear, now when Job's three friends heard all the evil that had befallen him, they came every one from his own place, for they had made an appointment to come together and visit him and comfort him. And when they had lifted up their eyes afar off, they knew him not. And crying out, they wept and rending their garments, they sprinkled dust upon their heads towards heaven. St. Gregory the Great applies this scene to the Holy Church when she enters a passion, a time of great trial, such as we are in now. St. Gregory says this, Holy Church, which is set in the midst of tribulation all this time of her pilgrimage. What is he saying? There's never a time she's not in some sort of passion. He says, which is set in the midst of tribulation all this time of her pilgrimage. Whilst she suffers wounds and mourns over the downfall of her members, symbolized by the death of the children of Job, has other enemies of Christ besides to bear with. Under Christ's name, meaning they're symbolized by the friends of Job who come to help him, but end up attacking him and plus his wife. St. Gregory the Great, Pope Pius XI, confirms this. His document on the sacred heart, the need to make reparation. He says, the expiatory passion of Christ is renewed and in a manner continued and fulfilled. Fulfilled in his mystical body, which is the church. We are to fill up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ, in the body of Christ, which we're members of. St. Gregory, he goes on. The friends of blessed Job, though they come together to him with a good purpose, yet do for this reason bear the likeness of heretics in that they fall away into sin by speaking without discretion. St. Gregory, they are heretics because they refuse to accept the suffering of Christ. You can reduce a lot of heretics down to that. They refuse to accept that the body of Christ on earth can and will suffer. They want a church without suffering. They want an ideal Eden-like church on earth. They want the church triumphant already here. They don't like the church militant. Heretics, because they refuse to accept the suffering of Christ, the continuation of Calvary down through space and time in his mystical body. St. Gregory, he says this, all heretics in contemplating the deeds of Holy Church lift up their eyes in that they are themselves down below. And when they look at her works, the objects which they are gazing at are set high above them. They're too carnal to understand the power of suffering. He goes on. Yet they do not know her in her sorrow. For she herself covets to receive evil things. Like Job, she covets to receive evil things here. So being purified, she may attain to the reward of an eternal recompense. And for the most part, she dreads prosperity. Words of St. Gregory. For the most part, she dreads prosperity. And joys in the hard lessons of her training. She joys in the hard lessons 
of her training. Therefore, heretics who aim at present things as something great know her not amidst her wounds. They know not the church crucified. Instead of ecce homo, it's ecce ecclesia, and they say, get her away from me. They look from down below. St. Gregory, for that which they see in her, they recognize not the reading of their own hearts. They recognize not this in their own lives. They don't know what suffering is. They don't understand what it means. While she then gaining ground, even by her adversaries, they themselves stick fast in their stupefaction because they know not by experiment the things they see. St. Gregory, thank you. Wow. There's much here to contemplate in our present sorrows of life in Holy Church at the beginning of Lent. But here are at least three little lessons. First, the church is indeed in a passion. Like few heretofore she's experienced. The enemies are both on the outside, the Chaldeans, the Sabaeans, but they're also on the inside, the wife, the friends. Some of them are wearing miters. Maybe a lot of them are. Let's be sober and alert and not run away or give way to the temptation to say, I can't take this suffering anymore. I'm going someplace else where it's safe. Second of all, if we're going to identify with our Holy Mother, we have to participate in her passion. Thus, we now begin Lent anew, a time to offer voluntary suffering, to know by experiment, as St. Gregory mentions, to know inside, in our hearts, by experiment, what we see in our Holy Mother. We put ashes on our head today, not as did the friends of Job, but as another Job, as a member of Christ's body. We meditate upon the passion. We make the stations of the cross, making the passion our own. In this way, we indeed know her and love her always in her sorrows, never parting from her side. Number three, no matter what happens, she gains ground. No matter what happens, she gains ground from all things. She receives evil things unto the good. Being another Job, we are careful then not to attack the church, nor to add to her pain, nor to seek some imagined ideal that is not the real church militant. In this way, we're not looking at her from afar off, but joining her and living with her and gaining merits with her now in her present state. Even as she endures many evil things, we are purified. Wow. Lent is upon us. Let's remain true and loving children of the church. Let us not allow this most valuable, precious time of penance this time to identify with the church. This most precious time of uniting ourselves with the mystical body in such a deep manner. Pass us by. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.